This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice. be glad and rejoice in it. All right, we're going to do that again, but not this morning. <laughs> it is a real good, good thing uh, to be present with you all this morning. Um, everybody's got a journey, and none of us know what it takes together in this way. And so thanks be to God that you all are here this morning. Um, last week was Mother's Day, and I'm still thinking about my mother. Um, and in preparing for um, this message this morning, uh, I thought about one of her amazing quotes. Um, she had a way of telling us what she wanted done. Some of you all can really resonate with this. She had a way of telling us what she wanted done and how she wanted it done and when she wanted it done and up on inspection to ensure that it had been done in the way in which um, she had directed. She would often find, uh, but not with me because I was the good kid, <laughs> but with my brothers that it was not done the way in which she wanted it done. And she would look at them firmly and she would say to them, if I have to tell you again, I can show you better than I can tell you. And you knew exactly what that meant because what she wanted us to understand was that when she told us what to do and how to do it and when it should be done, she expected that. And I have grown up to really appreciate that. And that really resonates with the word for today. God has instructed us, has told us how to care for one another. For several weeks, we have been talking about love and the many ways in which we are called to love one another. How that is to be given and received. And so today we look at the text, 1 John, verse 3, beginning with verse 11. Hear now God's word for us, God his children. For this is the message you heard from the beginning. We should love one another. Do not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised, my brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. You know that we have passed from death to life because we love each other. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Anyone who hates a brother or sister is a murderer. And who, and you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. This is how we know what love is. Jesus laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees one, brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. This is God's word for us, God, his children. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Dear God, as we gather in this sacred space, we, we invite you in. We invite you in not to this space because you are already here, but into our hearts that are often not available. God, we ask that you would create in us a clean heart and renew within us a right spirit that we would make room for your word 
your word, your word. In Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen. So in looking at the Bible closely, you know that's a good thing when you're gonna preach, right? It's okay to laugh today. Um, the subtitle for this text is more on love and hatred. And so when I read the subtext, the word more drew me in. And the reason is, is because this is one more time that God's word directs us to loving one another. And yet the challenges that we face in life in how to love one another. He even compared it to hate. And so I became curious and I just went back to the beginning of 1 John and I read all of 1 John. Now for those who know the Bible, that didn't take but half an hour. So you can go home and you can read all of 1 John. But 1 John is very um, instructive. It is about someone who has lived life a while. John, John's lived a while, and John has been around Jesus for a while. And now Jesus has gone, but Jesus taught him some things, and he taught him some things that he wanted to pass on to Christians. Now, sometimes I think as Christians, we become comfortable just because we're Christians. And this is a warning against that. And as I went back to the first chapter, I thought to myself, wow, this word, if, is an amazing word. He points out to us, if we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness. Some do. Some do. He goes on to say, if we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar. We're sinners. He goes on to say, but if anyone obeys the word, love for God is truly made complete in them. There is a lot of ifs in this passage. And it, it really made me think again about are we doing, are we being who God has called and created us to be? Or are we living a life of if I would have, I could have, I should have, only if. Let that not be our story, you all. For God is gracious and merciful, and God is calling us to a higher way of living and a deeper way of loving. The way that God calls and instructs us to love is rooted in his own life. We're only about four weeks post-Easter post-resurrection where the greatest story has been shared. We get to live it and that God laid down his life for us. And that ought to make all the difference in the world, that he knew us. He knew us like he knew Cain and Abel. For me, that's a troubling story, and yet this text that we draw from on today talks about brothers, siblings. Siblings, one killed another. Who does that? It sounds like some foreign story long time ago, but did you hear the news? Just last night, even this morning, did you, do you watch the news? We are not above this. We are not beyond it. The world is still broken and evil still exists. So what is our role? How are we called to matter in this thing that we call life? Will our footprints even be observed? Will people know that 
our love for Christ was more than just attending church. That we really understood that our greater call moves us beyond this physical building. I am humble to serve in a place called Christ Church where we again do things that are extraordinary. And in the last two years, I've come to recognize that we really, and it's okay, if Michelle will say this, we really have more to do. We do. I think that sometimes we do not do ourselves a service by being gentle all the times. Because God's word is not always gentle. But the hope and the prayer is that God's word is always convicting. And so as people who are called Christians, we have got to recognize that we are sinful in nature. Sin is not a bad word. It is bad behavior, though. And I am mindful that St. Augustine of Hippo, he, he invites us to think about sin in this way. He says, sin is a word, deed, or desire in opposition to the eternal law of God. So my question to me, as I was preparing this message, is, Michelle, how have your words, your deeds, your walk with Christ aligned with his commandment to love him and to love one another. And so today I extend the same invitation to each of you. How is your daily walk lining up with God's will, God's word, God's ways. It is not sufficient that we would come together on any particular day, whether it be Sunday or whether it be Tuesday Bible study, and we are immersed in worship and praise in the word of God and yet go forth living incompatible. So again, Self-examination, self-reflection, how are we doing this thing called love? I am reminded in this beautiful image, this lady, she has her hand over her mouth and over her eyes and it's about hearing no evil, speaking no evil, seeing no evil and what she says is like a broken record it plays over and over and over again. My thoughts strange. My feelings suffocated. It plays over and over and over again. Your sorry smile, your bitter sweet rejection, my broken heart, it remembers over and over and over again. And I thought to myself, how many times have you, Michelle, made someone to feel like that? Because you did not make yourself available. You didn't make time to extend compassion, open your heart to recognize what it means to be empathic to share a word of hope and encouragement. How is Christ, the love of Christ, being made visible in our walk? It doesn't take a whole lot. It really, really doesn't. But we just get so busy and so consumed more often than not with what the cost is, 
I don't really have time to go to the store and buy some groceries for the food bank or to go and volunteer. That takes time. Well, yeah, it does take time. But guess who the master timekeeper is? God. Every second that we live and breathe belongs to God. So what are we doing to express God's love and God's gratitude toward one another? The world is in need of healing. And I'm foolish enough, along with many of you all, I'm sure, to believe that if we come together as a body called Christians and live our faith in more excellent, godly ways, we can experience a world that's filled with reconciliation, with redemption, restored lives, homes, families, and communities, but we've got to be about the Father's business. I am so reminded of the story of Joseph. Joseph's story helps me to be a better person, as I'm sure it has helped many of you all, because Joseph, Joseph had reason to be bitter, to be angry, to be unloving, to be uncaring, to be greedy, to be selfish. He was given up into the hands of bandits. They didn't care what happened to him. His brothers, his own brothers. And yet, when they were in need, when everything that they had had been uh, relinquished. They, they had no more. They found their way to him. They didn't know it was his, their brother, but Joseph knew. And Joseph found it in his heart to forgive. And I have thought often, if Joseph could forgive, if Joseph could forgive, who am I, who are we, not to forgive one another. And out of his forgiveness, out of that deep sense of love, love that transcends hurt, love that transcends pain, families were restored. Isn't that what we want? It's not enough to say that we want it, but we're called to action to do the things, to take the steps that are necessary to bring forth these levels of reconciliation and redemption. And we can only do it through God's grace and God's unconditional love. Our church is rich. No, that doesn't mean that we don't need you to put your monies in the offering plate. That's not what I'm talking about. But I'm talking about in faith and in tradition. We have been given tools along the way to live out our faith in the most excellent ways. I am reminded that in our hymnal, oftentimes in worship, we are called to a service of communion sometimes, and then particularly at the 1055 where we engage in the confession and pardon. And this, this is important, you all, because we are called again not to simply read, but to live, to live out the scripture, to live out our creeds, our faith, the things that we affirm, we are called to live out. And this confession and pardon, it says, most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, in what we have done and what we have failed to do. And it goes on to ask God for forgiveness. What would this look like if we lived it out genuinely and authentically every single day? Not mere words on a page, but what we affirm we believe because we are Christians.
Christians because God has loved us and has called us to love one another. Not only does scripture inform us, our liturgy informs us, but there are songs. There are songs that really bless our lives. And there are two songs that I'd like to share with you. Some of us like contemporary music, some of us like traditional music. A contemporary song now that has me almost running out of my car. There have been times, seriously, I'm not even exaggerating, where I wanted to park my car and just get out and dance. And it's the song, um, Build My Hope, I think that's the name of it, I Build My Life, and it's by House Fire. And the words to this song are so powerful, and I say, God, this is how I want to live my life. Help me. Ask God to help us. It says, I will build my life upon your love. When we build our lives on the love of Christ, it changes everything. It goes on to say, it is a firm foundation. I will put my trust in you alone and I will not be shaken. So that when God calls us out to do things that are sometimes unimaginable, sometimes unsettling, sometimes uncertain, to have our hope rooted, our beliefs rooted that God's love will keep us and that we will not be shaken by life circumstances, it changes everything. And perhaps you haven't heard House Fire. <coughs> Hopefully you have heard this traditional hymn that comes, I think it's hymn number 594. Yesterday, I had the privilege of attending Perkins graduation, and it was a fine gathering of good Methodists and other religions. <laughs> that was funny too, you all. <laughs> and the closing hymn, the closing hymn spoke to my heart, and it was the absolute illustration that I thought, wow, this is the song I pray that will be imprinted upon our hearts that we might go forth to show God's love, to show God's love, to be walking billboards of what it means. The words are, Lord, you give the great commission. None of us do that. God has done that. He goes on to say to heal the sick and preach the word, lest the church neglect its mission. Y'all, let us be found faithful. Let us be found faithful. It says, and the gospel go unheard. Let the gospel be spoken through your life. Not just words, but through your life. Help us to witness to your purpose with renewed integrity. There are a few things that I hope that when I leave this world that people will know about me. And one is love and the other is integrity. You can't say you love God and not demonstrate it in your daily walk. And to then go on and to say, with the Spirit's great empower, empower us for the work of your ministry. The Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will speak and will make it plain. You will know it because of your sense of being. You will not be anxious. You will know that God is with you. You will not be fearful, but you will be faithful. You will not be negligent, but you will be noble in what you say and what you do. And the light and the love of Christ 
will shine in and through you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, be blessed. <laughs>